in many ways that are invisible to those around us, we are called upon to do brave things. From Interfaith Alliance, this is State of Belief Radio. I'm Alliance President Reverend Paul Brandeis Rauschenbusch, broadcasting this week from New York City. And, and how we respond in those moments, the ones hidden from you, are perhaps the most significant of all. The Right Reverend Marianne Buddy is the Episcopal Bishop of Washington, D.C. She is a fitting author for a book titled, How We Learn to Be Brave, Decisive Moments in Life and Faith. This week, she's back on our show to share some of the lessons in this inspiring and challenging book. You know, the Jewish community is not monolithic, nor is the Christian community, nor is the Muslim community. I mean, I think we need to understand that there are nuances within each of these faiths, and a lot of work needs to be put in to find common ground internally and externally. Everyone at Interfaith Alliance is delighted to have Darcy Hirsch join us as Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy. With our priority issues regularly surfacing at the Supreme Court on Capitol Hill and in states across the nation, Darcy has a substantial portfolio, and we will look at some of her priorities on this week's State of Belief Radio. You can hear State of Belief on the radio and listen at Apple Podcasts and all other podcast platforms. Every week, I am in conversation with some of the most impactful and fascinating civic and religious leaders across the nation. Please subscribe to it today. State of Belief Radio is made possible in great part by generous support of our listeners. If you made a donation, thank you for helping get these conversations heard by more people who need them. If you haven't pitched in yet, information on how you can help keep this show on the air is available at stateofbelief.com. And you can find out more about the work of Interfaith Alliance and join us at interfaithalliance.org. And now to my first guest. Bishop Marianne Buddy of Washington, D.C. is the author of a new book titled How We Learn to Be Brave, Decisive Moments in Life and Faith. Speaking truth to power when called to do so, and bolstered by a history of social justice activism, Bishop Buddy hinted at the contents of this book when she was on the show just a few months ago, and is keeping her promise to be back with us as this book sees the light of day. Bishop Buddy, welcome back to State of Leaf Radio. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be with you. And congratulations. This is a huge accomplishment. I... I spent um, last night just poring over this book, and it's. Mm-hmm. I just really appreciate. I appreciate it when people who we see in a big pulpit being all, you know, oh look at she's so powerful, she's so amazing, and then someone, you know, opens up and says, actually, you know, what you're seeing is not what's real. What you're seeing is the culmination of a lot of experiences and choices and moments, some of which were great and some of which actually I failed at. And recognizing that being brave is not about just like, you know, some sort of magical, mythical way of you were just born, uh, but actually it's a lot about learning. And I just think I, I really want to say how much I appreciated the the honesty, the vulnerability, which I think is actually maybe part of the lesson you're trying to teach. Thank you for all of that, Paul. And I would say that's one of the primary messages I wanted to convey, that courage is learned when any of us needs to step out beyond what we know, what we can see, what we've done before. And that's a moment of vulnerability. And by by definition, we're not going to be necessarily good at whatever it is we're being called to on the first try, or that we're going to be um, successful or we're going to get it right, whatever that means. But we're going to learn as we go. And the learning to be brave and learning from the examples of other people's lives learning from the examples that are handed down to us in our sacred traditions and paying attention to those moments, large and small, that help us become the people we are called to be. And that was the other purpose I had or a desire I had was to broaden the definition of what courage looks like. 
or how we understand it so that we can appreciate how often in life, in many ways that are invisible to those around us, we are called upon to do brave things and, and how we respond in those moments are um, even the ones hidden from you are perhaps the most significant of all. Mm. The book starts with a moment where everybody kind of looked to you and said, oh, isn't she brave? Isn't she courageous? And that was after then President Trump used force to walk across Lafayette Square and hold the Bible upside down and kind of claim religion using a an Episcopal church, a very famous St. John's Episcopal church, um, almost as a prop, as a backdrop. And that you responded in a way that many people felt very grateful for and said, mm-hmm. oh, you know, she she knew what to do. She knew how to do it. Look at her. That's what we mean when we're talking profiles and courage kind of thing. Um, and, you. and then you go backwards and say, you know, that is a great example. And by and large, I'm, I think I did actually do the right thing that day. And yet, you know, if you think my day to day is exactly that one after another, that's not what happened. And then you take us all the way back to a, a childhood that actually was filled with having to make really hard choices, sometimes when there was no clear good choice to make. I think it's important to recognize that sort of evolution. And a lot of this, we have like baked in from early days about how we're supposed to be and did we do the right thing? Are we, you know, and so can you just take us back there? Because there was a really interesting moment when you spoke on a panel and everybody went right. back to when they were young. It was Bruce Filer, I think, who was the moderator. And it really kind of surprised Bruce, who I think is very smart and very good, that all of you kind of led by your example went so far back to think about right. what it meant to be a leadership. And so maybe just, you know, giving us a little insight as to how you start the book and why you started at a really difficult yeah. moment in your youth. Thank you. First, let me just say quickly about the June 1st, 2020 moment, because that to me was an example of um, of those times in life when we don't have time to think. We are responding in the moment. And those moments come. Uh, they don't come very often, but when they do, we have to rely on whatever it is we have at that moment, right? So that was like a very distinctive kind of moment. Um, And I contrasted it, as you said, with other moments, and one of them being the times in life when we are called to leave one place and go another, and um, to leave what is familiar and move to someplace unfamiliar. And I chose the example that you alluded to, which is from my adolescence, in part because when I think of courage, when I think of what it means to be brave in my own life story, that's the story I always go back to. That's the, that's the archetypal moment for me, the one upon which everything else is in some way compared because of how, how it, how strongly I felt it at the time and how aware I was of what I was doing at a time when the people around me and most of the authority figures of my life at the time that mattered to me, and indeed the community I cherish the most, would have supported me in not doing what I felt called to do, which was um, briefly to leave uh, a community that I had developed in high school that was like my sacred community, to leave a church community that had nurtured me and introduced me to faith, because my my home life had completely disintegrated. And I really had only one parent to return to, which was a mother I had left when I was a young child. And I'll spare all the details, but the, the main pieces that were so pivotal to me was that I was listening to a voice from within that was summoning me really to make this choice that I didn't particularly want to make. And I knew it. And it meant gently saying no to those well-meaning people around me who wanted to keep me safe and comfortable in the life I had known. 
And I, I look back on that moment because so many things of my life now were put in motion because of that move. But when I, you're talking to the panel, there were four of us, three or four of us who were gathered on Zoom um, during the pre-vaccine, really terrifying days of the pandemic. And Bruce Feiler had published his book on his thesis that we have these enormous life transitions that come at us in explosive ways. He calls them a life quake. And he asked all of us on the panel after the end of our conversation to discuss one such moment in our life. So thinking about, it's always the first one that comes to mind. So I shared what I shared with you a little bit, feeling kind of silly as I did because I was with all these really big dignitaries. But then one by one, an imam shared his story of traveling to the United States with his father, who was a very esteemed Muslim leader because he was ill and he traveled to the United States to receive treatment and how his father was treated with such respect and care by a Jewish doctor and a Christian doctor, people that this Iman, now, now a man, said he had been taught never to trust and in some ways to hate. And that changed his worldview and informed his path. So stories like that. And uh, this is Imam Majid, who, of course, now Imam is one, Majid, of, right? who's one of the major interfaith figures in America. Like so, literally, exactly. if, he's one, if you had That's five correct. of any people, you would lift up him as one of them. And it was because of that. Yeah, it was because of that experience as a young, as a teenager watching and dedicating his life to that moment. So moments like that. So I think personally, and one of the reasons why coming of age stories are so important um, in literature and in film is because so many of those decisive self-defining moments do come when we're young. I I think we who are like, you know, use the language of faith, we often talk about being called to something, we much less frequently talk about being called away from something. Right. You know, I mean, right. we, you know, oh, I was called to this position. I was called to this ministry. I was called to, and, and I remember like leaving a job that I really loved and taking another job because I felt like it was time for me to leave. And I wasn't sure. A lot of people were like, you're crazy. I was leaving Princeton University. And my dad, who was 40 years at University of Wisconsin Law, was like, you're leaving Princeton to go to a website? You know, I mean, like, what are you talking? This is when I went to Huffington Post. And to him, it was absolutely mystified. But I felt called, you know, I I felt called away because I was just like, it's not right for me right now. My guest is Bishop Marion Buddy. Her new book is titled How We Learn to Be Brave, Decisive Moments in Life and Faith. I want to talk about another moment, which is not a is not highlighted in the in the book, but it really struck me was when you were called to speak at a Black Lives Matter rally and the lights came on you and you were like one of the big wigs and one of the real smart people who were supposed to hold forth and, you know, tell everybody what what's what. And you kind of froze for a moment and didn't say anything. And then one of the protesters was like. Sit down. Shut up. And in, instead of being outraged and instead of being like, you know, how dare you? You know, um, you know I'm a bishop. You went and sat down. And you yeah. sat down next to the person. And it's just one of those moments where you actually, I think that's brave. Because like I mean, the, the thing that you knew how to do is like, okay, let me get my act together. I'm going to talk about Jesus. And, and da, 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 da. instead, you you just said, okay. I'm going to do that. And I think that that's another moment. It's a decisive moment you couldn't have prepared for. It was also, it it involved humility, which we don't think of bravery and humility together. But often, I think sometimes the most, sometimes that little voice is so annoying because sometimes, (laughs) you know, you're laughing. You know, I mean, sometimes like I'll get in an argument with someone and it can be like a colleague. It can be, you know, another Religiously, it can be my family, it can be anybody. And they're saying, you've got to you got to make it right. And I'm like, no, 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 they got to make it right. They got to do that. That's not me. That's them. Every time that I listen to that voice, it's the right thing to do. And it's the hardest thing to do because it's me saying I have to do something. And it's it's basically humbling myself to make something right 
um, even when I'm not sure that I was totally wrong. Uh, you know, but I just think we think of these bravery often as like with the sword and the big thing, but it's often just those small moments. I mean, and you have them all throughout this book, which I'm going to say the name again. It's How We Learn to Be Brave, Decisive Moments in Life and Faith. Talk to me about those small moments where you have to follow that voice and it's not fabulous. Right. Well, first of all, what you've described and that that voice inside or that sensation, whatever that is, that is the invitation, I think. When we listen or we have a sense, and you said that you recognized it, right? You know that feeling. And if we can pay attention to that, I'm not saying it's always accurate because we're human, right? But the the idea of listening deeply to that summons is one of the threads that carries through the book because it does take us in different directions depending on what the circumstance requires of us in that moment. And in your case, what you were describing was an invitation to take the first step perhaps towards reconciliation or to do what you can in your words, to make it right. And that's a step into courage because you don't know how the other person is going to respond. In that moment that you were describing on Black Lives Matter Plaza, you know, I, it was clear to me that, that, that the cameras and the microphones wanted those of us gathered, the faith leaders to gather, to talk to the cameras and the microphones. And, and all the cameras and microphones had displaced people who had been sitting in the hot sun all day with their public witness. And when I realized that, that that's what the moment was, and it didn't feel right to me anyway, but when this young man said, sit down and shut up, I thought, darn it, he's, he's right. He's right. And then when I sat down and, and I wrote what he said, which is, we've been out here in the sun all day, and you show up, and the cameras show up, and when you leave, they're going to leave, and we'll still be here. And so who was the courageous one in that moment? It wasn't, do you know, I mean, who, whose witness was the most important? He was brave to just say what was true for him, you know, uh, and, and not like, just like say, okay, this is another moment where we get to be disrespected and not say what we, what we really feel. And then you like, it's a telling story. I wish more like religious leaders heard that story <laughs> because, you know, we, we, we have a tendency to be like, yeah, put me in the pulpit. Let me go. Um, and I think that was just really, a you know, that was really powerful. So tell me, is there a difference between being brave and courageous or is that just semantics? I'm happy for you to tell me there's no difference. Um, but if you if you think there is one. Yeah, for me, the words are interchangeable. I, I think there is a slight semantic difference, but not one that operationally for me makes a yeah. lot of difference. Yeah, I, um, I think that's right. I find them as synonyms and perhaps brave in some ways connotes those, you know, big dramatic moments and courage has more of that inner quality. But I like the idea of using brave for those inner moments because as with what you're describing and what I've experienced, and I think others do too in this long arc of a life, is that listening and taking that step in some ways is a crisis moment. And we know it because we, we, we have to make a choice and we have to decide sometimes quickly and sometimes over a long period of time, like choosing again and again and again to stay on a certain path. And each time there's this there's the option of not doing it or the option of, of saying no. And we say no too, right? So, but just to learn how to take that step and acknowledge it for what it is, even if there aren't a lot of microphones in your face asking you to pontificate on it as it's happening. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Um, talk to me about the referencing of the... Um, kind of the, the Christian text throughout the book. There's a lot of like, I don't know if it was uh, Frederick Buechner who said like, listen yeah. to your life or, uh, yeah, I mean, there's listening to your life, but then there's also like looking for inspiration in the tradition. Uh, give me one example from one of your favorite stories that is really <laughs> instructive in the kind of nuanced, not easy understanding of bravery 
but really that resonates with you. Wow. Thank you. Um, yes, I feel like it's as a person of faith, it's part of our regular practice, but I think we all do it on some level in reference to something, which is looking for the places where we can take our experience seriously enough to go deeper in it. And so when we are inspired by the examples or the stories of others, we are emboldened to live more more intentionally on the path that's been entrusted to us. And, and I believe sacred scripture does that for all, us for all the time. And that in some ways, the spirit of God works through the text to keep us animated, to say, you're not alone in this and look at this as a pattern or a possibility. One of my favorites, I have many, is when Jesus decides to turn his face toward Jerusalem. You can almost miss it in the gospel text because it's like a line that's buried in the middle of a sentence, in the middle of a chapter. And um, and there's not that much difference in how the story goes from before he decides to do it and afterwards. But everything about the story of his life at that point, and this is in the Gospel of Luke, shifts from Jesus walking from his home base of the Galilee region down south toward Jerusalem. And along the way, he does pretty much what he's been doing all along. He heals people, he teaches people, he's you know, mentoring his disciples and getting them ready, but his focus is on Jerusalem. And he knows what's waiting there. Others don't know, don't want to know, but he knows. And for me, I use that example to begin the chapter called just choosing to start. When we set ourselves on a course in life or we see a destination in our mind's eye and we start walking toward it. And in the beginning, nobody's paying much attention because frankly, it's a long way off and and even if we talk about it, it's like, great, you know, go for it. Or And we just start making those choices. But the goal, the destiny is in our minds. And so his, his example and what happens to him along the way and how he gets closer. And it, all those, those are some of the ways. It's one of the yeah, ways. It's a perfect example because also it's not a particularly um, fun moment. It leads to a great moment of hope and then a terrible devastation and then ultimately hope. But, you know, it's not like, oh, great, let's, you know, um, let's do something easy. It's it's actually turning towards something hard. And and that I think is when he moves there, he starts to get a little impatient with the people who don't want to follow him or not impatient. But he's like, okay, don't come. (laughs) <laughs> you know, if you don't want to come, don't come, right? But this is where I'm going. And the well, disciples and also don't like, get and, and he gets impatient with the disciples who are like, yeah, this is going to yeah, be fabulous. Yeah, like, this, this is, this is going to be like, you, you know, you're going to be like, oh, this is going to be a big party. Everybody's going to welcome you and we're going to all live happily after. And, the, you know, easy peasy, uh, lemon squeezy. And I love it when Jesus becomes impatient because it's another moment like fully human and fully divine, right. fully human. <laughs> Don't forget, you know, I mean, like that is one of the great things about for those of us who are in the Christian tradition. Um, let me ask you this. You're going to get a lot of people who are now going to you're going to be the expert on being brave now. <laughs> so you're like you're the professional brave person you put out a book like this and all of a sudden you're the professional brave person which is totally you know as you know that I'm, I'm being humorous but what's the primary piece of advice that you would give people who are like okay I read your book I'm just trying to figure out how to use this in my life what would you say to them hmm Wow. To be honest, I'm I'm not sure what I would say, except to encourage them to pay attention to what is stirring within them. It would depend a lot on if this were a person dealing with uh, personal issues or public ones, but to, to make sure that as they strive to live a courageous life, to see whatever moment they're kind of looking at or or focusing their energies on, to take the wider lens of life. Because there are the moments when we feel that we're being called upon to do whatever it is we do. But extending the lens wider, there's a lot that leads up to moments like that, some of which we're aware of and some of which we're not. There are seasons of preparation and we may not even know what we're being prepared for. 
And even more importantly, there are all the moments that follow, most of which are either a bit of a letdown or just life without drama. And we have to keep in mind whatever insights we were given or whatever feeling we had when, when things were clear and try to live as if those moments were in fact real. And so it's a lot about perseverance. And maybe that would be the final word is that this is a life not of leaping from big moment to big moment, but life in all of its fullness and paying attention, honoring the moments as they come to us and and living the life that is ours to live. Thank you so much for that. I, I, I can't let you go before I say how much we enjoyed being at the cathedral on Easter. It was it was beautiful. It was moving. And my eight-year-old son referenced your sermon in a conversation later, which uh, but yeah. is big praise. <laughs> you know, when you actually have an eight-year-old who heard the sermon and asks a question about it, and then we're we're having a conversation, and that's the definition of a good church visit. So thank you so much for, for that great day and for this incredible new book, How We Learn to Be Brave, Decisive Moments in Life and Faith. The Right Reverend Marion Edgar Buddy is the Episcopal Bishop of Washington, D.C. She was previously a parish priest for 18 years and spent time in public activism for social justice. Her new book, How We Learn to Be Brave, Decisive Moments in Life and Faith. It it was published this week. Pick it up. Learn. Enjoy. Bishop Buddy, thank you so much for being with us again on State of Belief Radio. I appreciate it so much. Thank you, Paul. It was a delight for me to see you and to talk with you again. Coming up next, the new Senior Director of Advocacy and Policy at Interfaith Alliance, Darcy Hirsch. If you miss any part of today's program, you can hear full episodes of State of Belief anytime on our website. You'll also find links to the topics we discussed this week, extended interviews and transcripts, and an archive of past shows, all at State of Belief. Dot com. You're listening to State of Belief Radio, where religion and democracy meet. In her first weeks as Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy at Interfaith Alliance, Darcy Hirsch has hit the ground running. No surprise there. Her impressive track record of advocacy includes providing legal representation for marginalized people, serving as Associate Regional Director at ADL, leading community relations at JCRC of Greater Washington, and most recently, Associate Vice President at the Jewish Federation of North America. And I'm really happy to be able to introduce her to you on this week's show. Darcy, welcome to State of Leaf Radio. Hello, Paul. I'm so excited to be here with you today. This is thrilling. I am so excited to be working with you, alongside you. You come with such an amazing background. And so you went to Harvard Divinity, then you went to Cardoza Law, and you've just had this amazing experience of of joining law and religion and democracy and how we function together as people. And so tell me a little bit about your background before you came to Interfaith Alliance. Like you're from New York City or I know you went to college in New York City. Where? Yeah, I actually grew up in Buffalo, New York, which I feel very, very deeply connected to my hometown and then moved to New York City for college grew up active in the Jewish community and really my my personal activism and sense of justice is guided by my Jewish values, my sense of the Jewish concept of tikkun olam, which uh, means repairing the world. And everything I've ever done really has, I felt, given me the tools that I need to make positive change in the world. Back from my days as a civil rights attorney fighting for prisoners' rights in the New York State legislature, giving voices to those that couldn't necessarily advocate for themselves, I've really worked to mobilize individuals, communities, to give them the tools 
to speak out and to make positive change in the world. And I've really found that working in, in a faith context, um, because so many are guided by their faith values, is really a positive and unifying way that we can work together to make change in the world. I think that's great. And, you know, what you said is like a unifying way. People immediately think religion is divisive, but it doesn't have to be. And often in advocacy spaces, you find people from different faith traditions, as well as people who represent secular traditions, coming together to build a, a local community, a national community, a global community that they want to see. And I think that's really important. And that's part of your background is actually, when you went to Harvard Divinity, you didn't go there just to study Jewish values. You actually went there in some ways to expand what you understood as like the language of, of religion. Uh, and so talk to me a little bit about your experience of working across faith lines. Yeah, I mean, so I actually went to Harvard Divinity School to study early Christianity. Um, I really found that the birth of Christianity in the context of, of Second Temple Judaism was was just so critical to think about in the historical context and what it means really internationally for us as communities of faith, devising together, you know, what are the commonalities and differences of our faith and how can we find common ground? And so I I went to Harvard to learn in a community of faith. Um, I lived in a house with, with a bunch of other folks, you know, studying very different flavors of, of religion. And that time really, really taught me about our, our shared values and how we can all work together. And it was just such an incredible experience, but it's really, it's really made it a con significant contribution to, to how I live out my values in this world through interfaith work in the New York State Legislature, Virginia. Uh, you know, following my work in New York, I moved down to the DC region and I advocated um, with a, an interfaith community in Virginia to, to work for economic justice and to fight hate crimes and moving to the federal level on a national effort to fight hate crimes together, I've just found that there is so much more that unites us than divides us. And when you talk about political partisanship, and when you talk about, you know, the divisiveness of religion, there, there's just so much more that we have in common, and we have to find that common ground. Well, it's interesting. Your last work was at the um, Jewish Federation of North America. That's right. Is it's it? the, the Jewish Federations of North America. It was okay, a national, okay. national philanthropic network. What's interesting is even within our faith communities, and sometimes especially within our faith communities, it's it's hard to find that common value. You, we work to find common value, but but sometimes we are so passionate about our own tradition and what it leads us to that we we try to find common ground right now. It's especially hard. I'll speak personally for me um, looking at what some people are doing with Christianity right now. I've just mystified and it, and it makes me, I have to say, especially disturbed because we care about Jesus. We care about a tradition and we interpret it in such different ways. And I almost feel like my, my ire is more directed at people within my own faith than others. And one of the things you were doing at the Jewish Federation was trying to find common language to work for common purpose. And I have to say that that sounds like hard work. Interfaith work is, you know, has its own challenges. Intrafaith work can be even harder. And some of the, what I really was so attractive about you as a, as a candidate and now as a colleague was you managed to sometimes bring very different segments of the Jewish community together to work on common themes. Um, and that shows a real skill around language, around bringing people together and really a heart for that kind of work. Absolutely. I mean, the, you know, the Jewish community is not monolithic, nor is the Christian community, nor is the Muslim community. I mean, I think we need to understand that there are nuances within each of these faiths, and a lot of work needs to be put in to find common ground internally and externally. Yeah. Well, we are so glad that you are part of the team. It's already like a, a great esprit de corps. And um, I think I may have even like said to you, oh, you know, take your time, like, you know, ease into the role. Of course, that was malarkey, as as some pol one political figure likes to say, because, you know, it, we're, we're on the hill. We're at next to the Supreme Court. So much is happening right now. I wonder if you can give us kind of 
your interpretation of the state of play? Like, what what is going on right now as we record this? We're in the middle of brinksmanship around the, the debt limit. We're, we have impending uh, court cases that are going to be very consequential. How do you understand this moment in Washington, D.C.? And what are some areas that you're looking to towards? How, this is where we can move the needle. It's a moment, um, but it's always a moment in D.C., right? Um, but I have to say, you know, walking up to the office this morning, there's a crowd congregated in front of the Supreme Court. And it's just, you know, it's invigorating to, to be here, to see that, to know that people are out there making their voices heard. And it's just so important that that we are all tracking, that we're all in touch with, with our members of Congress and sharing our, our values and our concerns. That is really key. Like, I think we forget that actually reaching out to our representatives, not throwing up our hands and saying, well, that's D.C. Actually, you have a voice. You can use your voice. Other people might be using their voice. Use your voice. Let your representative know how you feel about what's happening. And, you know, we're trying to connect people in local communities around the country with their leaders. And and so it's just an important reminder, what you just said, that seems obvious. But we, you know, we often forget how important every one of your voices, listeners, is in this conversation. That's right. That's right. It's not just news. There's something you can do about it. So so headlines today, you know, are the negotiations around the debt limit. Very concerned about whether or not they're going to make an agreement and whether or not we're going to go into default. There are some fundamental concerns around the negotiation that is making it so hard. There's there's a sense of morality. When we think about, you know, our federal spending, there's a sense of, do we take care of people? Do we pay for health and human services? Are we paying to support the people who have gone into economic decline since the, the COVID pandemic? I mean, there's a, there's a lot to be taken into account. And so, of course, that is a really serious negotiation. Um, and we're hoping they can make headway soon. But in the meantime, you know, other things are are happening. We have a couple of major Supreme Court decisions coming down the pike very soon that could impact religious freedom and uh, discrimination against the LGBTQ community. The Senate uh, is moving forward to confirm judicial nominations. You know, we have 92 vacancies in federal courts around the country with 32 pending nominees. So the Senate needs to needs to move those forward. and, And they are as quickly as possible. And at the same time, you know, there are bills moving forward in the House of Representatives that would really strip the rights of the LGBTQ community um, that are extremely concerning. And thankfully, they will not move forward in the Senate. But we need to keep ensuring that voices are heard, that stories of LGBTQ and trans kids are being told, that communities of faith are reaching out to their members of Congress and saying, you know, you're hearing from a very loud loud minority and we as communities of faith uh, believe in equal rights for for everyone. We will not discriminate um, under the guise of religious freedom. And we mm. believe in a diverse, diverse America where every faith and every person is given what they need. I think what you're saying is so important. It just we we had uh, we had our colleague Maureen to talk about Faith for Pride last week, and it's just you know it's a reminder that faith voices must speak up around these bills, both in the national level but also your local level. There are there are bills pending that are being promoted by a minority uh, view, and it is it is just essential that people of all faith traditions, moral traditions, secular traditions show up and say, this is, doesn't represent us. So one of the things I'm, I love about the way you talk about our, our work together is, is the, the interplay between our national network and our work in Washington, D.C. These are not like super discreet things that can never talk about one another, in part because of what we've already touched on. You know, local politics have, have national... Uh, you know, representatives. And so like we're, we're, we're the interplay between bringing people to DC to tell stories. And I just think that's a really important part is like telling stories that impact people and that change the way people view um, those who are easy to demonize, maybe on the margins, maybe you've never met them. And so I think that all of that is, is this exciting interplay of national state and and also storytelling and media. 
That's right. I mean, I'll never forget walking into offices in the Virginia Capitol in Richmond demonstrating, you know, hand in hand with, you know, my Muslim and Christian brothers and sisters uh, that we were there together on a unified issue. And, and the legislators, many of whom were from other districts that weren't familiar with, with us or of our faiths, were, were just surprised to, to see us as people and hear our stories and hear our values um, because the other side was was so loud. So it's all about building that relationship. You know, I love walking the halls of Congress, right? But it's really about individuals who are connecting with the person that they voted for office or didn't vote. But then I say, you know, I, I belong to this church that's in your district. I belong to the synagogue or this mosque. Uh, it, it, it creates a connection. They're from your community. They understand. Um, and it's your your voice and your vote that that matters. And I, I think sometimes people think, oh, I didn't vote for them. I can't talk to them. I don't think that's true. I think actually if you come at, at, at your political leader who maybe is on the other side of the aisle, but come at them with civility and just say, here, I really just want you to hear my story and why I feel so passionate about this bill. That what we're talking about is is essential politics, but that it's also about, it's about people and it's about building power through people. And I think that's just so important. My guest is Darcy Hirsch, Interfaith Alliance Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy. One of the things that happened this week was that the White House released a really important initiative around combating anti-Semitism. And this is a challenge, a pernicious, persistent, terrible uh, challenge that the Jewish people have faced, It's, I think you can say, throughout history. And it's happening right now in America. And I really appreciate the fact that the Biden administration is taking it seriously. And I'm really proud that Interfaith Alliance just released our own Mobilizing Against Anti-Semitism resource that people can find on our website at interfaithalliance.org slash anti-Semitism that helps local communities not feel paralyzed, but actually compelled to address this. Maybe can you talk a little bit about how you understand this initiative from the Biden administration, as well as, you know, you were really essential in getting our um, this resource across the finish line. Sure. The, the Biden-Harris administration has done an amazing job um, addressing hate and bias generally. Um, you know, last summer they, they convened a United Against Hate Summit and have really committed to public education, to engaging in ways to, to fight hate and discrimination. And given the particular rise in anti-Semitism over, over the last several years, that is just really unheard of. Each, each year, the FBI statistics say that this is the highest year, and it, it, it just keeps coming, and, and independent analyses say the same. It's really time uh, for a national strategy in addition to the fact that anti-Semitism is really, you know, really connected to, to Christian nationalism, to white supremacy, to um, a significant number of, of the violent hate crimes that have occurred over the last several years, there are always anti-Semitic tropes. And so I think that there's a, a lack of understanding around the history of anti-Semitism and in many ways how it manifests which is why I was so proud and in my first days at, at, at Interfaith Alliance to really help help finalize our resource that, that really breaks down how anti-Semitism impacts the Jewish community and the community more broadly and how as we as an interfaith network can teach one another and build relationships. I mean, that's that's really what it's about. It's about understanding and it's about hearing, hearing from one another. Um, and so the fact that the Biden administration has launched a national strategy is really, really historic. And to have our, our resource be included as a part of that is is really is, is thrilling. I'm extremely uh, proud of it. And I think we we do a good job of not prescribing everything that a community should do. We're not like saying, and this is what you must do. What we're offering, and I think this is the best way, is to say, these are some of the ways that you should be, uh, you might look at this, but this is the reality. Uh, and, you know, we did something similar with the anti-Muslim hate a couple years ago. Unfortunately, Muslims and Jews 
are the targets, uh, the religious targets. And, and, and among that, I will say people who are perceived as Muslims, often Sikh Americans, often uh, Hindu Americans, you know, they're, they're, they are targeted in a way. And it's just really important to name it, mobilize against it, especially, and I love the way you frame this, this is an opportunity for community building writ large. This is a way for us to get to know one another and to really show up for one another. And when we show up for one another, we're going to be able to change our communities. We're going to be able to build great networks. And we're going to say, we're going to say, no, not in our town. We're not, we're not going to have it. And we have to be realistic. There are people in this country who do hold white supremacy, Christian nationalists, and they're showing up. They are showing up and we need to show up stronger. And I think that's the that's the goal here. We need to cast a different vision. That's not the vision we want for America. This violent Christian nationalist white supremacist vision. We want a diverse vision where everyone can thrive alongside with one another and that we support one another. I just think it's it's part of this broader effort that we're engaged in is casting this vision uh, to welcome everyone. And so I, I, I just really appreciate all you're doing. I, I have to ask you... Um, how you're feeling right now about the 2024 elections and what do you think faith communities that care about this vision that I just talked about, what we should do as we approach candidates and as we approach issues and how can we kind of elevate the conversation? We can't necessarily count on politicians to do that, but we can elevate the conversation. What, what thoughts do you have about that? So we need to get involved. We need to get out there. We need to go to candidates forums. We need to listen to what the candidates are saying and track what they're saying. How does that drive with your values? How does that, um, what, do, what does what they're saying mean for us as a pluralistic nation? And talk about it. If you have a concern, reach out with your concern get involved in, in elections, make sure that poll workers are safe. I mean, there's just, you have to pay attention. And this goes kind of back to what we were saying at the beginning about it's not just news. There's actually something you can do about it. I love that. That's right. It's not just news. There's something you can do about it. It's not something ha that necessarily is happening to you. We can be a part of making sure what happens reflects our, our values. I, I think that's great. I like to end asking uh, folks on the show, what gives them hope? And so I'm going to ask you right now, what gives you hope? Um, what gives me hope are the crowds of people standing outside the Supreme Court. It's the crowds of people I'm running into in the halls of Congress when I'm going in for meetings. There are actually middle school students all over the hill right now learning about our government. And that's what gives me hope that 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 we're all going to be engaged. We're going to lift up our voices and that Interfaith Alliance has an incredible network of community of faith that we can engage to, to raise our voices together. I love that. It, again, this is a theme showing up, being present, being engaged with one another, with our own communities, and then also with other communities working up side by side to make a, a vision of a pluralistic, diverse, just America come true. I think it's so great. Darcy Hirsch is Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy at Interfaith Alliance. Darcy, I know we will be hearing from you often on State of Belief Radio. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you. And with that, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for this week's show. We need your help keeping State of Belief on the air. I hope you'll consider being a partner in this crucial work by making a financial contribution today. Information on how to donate is available at stateofbelief.com. That's stateofbelief.com. And you can also be a part of making sure informative and encouraging voices like these are heard by sharing this program with family and friends. Let's get more people listening and more people taking part in these conversations, both on and off the air. Never miss an episode by subscribing to the weekly State of Belief 
podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. And join the conversation. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at State of Belief and share State of Belief with the people in your life. State of Belief is produced by Ray Kirstein and is a production of Interfaith Alliance. Become a member today at interfaithalliance.org. Okay, people, listen up. We've got a major announcement about a bigger and broader future for State of Belief coming up on June 10th. So plan on tuning in and be sure to join us for next week when I'll be talking with Ryan Burge, Master Observer of Trends in American Culture and Religion. And I'll be talking with attorney and author Rabbi Jay Michelson. I can't wait. Until then, I'm Paul Rauschenbusch on State of Belief, where religion and democracy meet.